What is goody fellas and welcome back to the channel if you are new around here my name is Perrin Crow and I'm somewhat of a NCAA 14 extraordinaire or somebody who just has a lot of time in their day to play this game anyway the point is you guys have been asking for a very long time for an updated in-depth everything that you need to know recruiting guide so that you guys can jump fresh into the game and know exactly what to do what to recruit now Two things to go over. First things first, I am absolutely horrible at explaining things. So instead of breaking it down really in depth, I'm just gonna do what I would normally do and explain why I'm doing it and what I'm thinking, etc. <laughs> if that makes sense, I've already gotten off to a horrible start. Second thing, this is a collab video with a good friend of mine by the name of Nitro Drive, formerly known as Legion. His link will be the top one in the description. He's not here with me right now, but if at any point in the video he feels like he has something to add on, he will do that. He is somebody I would trust with my life in terms of recruiting in NCAA 14. He's played the game for a lot longer than I have as well. So his knowledge, he probably knows a lot more than I do. In fact, he's the one who found the squat cheese, if you know what I'm talking about. What's goody, fellas? <laughs> I can't even do it. All right, so by this point, you're probably wondering who just showed up on my screen. My name is Jack. I'm the editor for this channel, but I also run a channel called Nitro Drive that launched just a couple days ago with a video titled How CFB Revamped Revived NCAA Football 14. So if you're here, I'm going to assume you're interested in that. And since I'm going to help you recruit today, it would mean a lot to me if you could run over and check out that video, possibly even drop a sub. Who knows? And Crow and I kind of decided that once and for all, we wanted to make the ultimate NCAA Football 14 recruiting guide so you guys would never have to rely on another one ever again. So that being said, I'll fill in where I feel necessary. And as always, let's get into it, fellas. I'm going to be doing two completely different seasons with two completely different teams in two completely different dynasties. For both of those, I'll be level three. One will be a good team. One will be a bad team. For the people who aren't as hardcore and extreme and you want to start a brand new dynasty that's challenging but also fun at the same time and you do get the players you want, you want to start on level 15 first and foremost. Now without a shadow of a doubt, the exact recruiting skills you are going to need are of course scouting, max that out at level 3, that's just going to make sure when you do scout people you get their entire overall. You definitely, definitely need to get royal treatment, first and foremost, as well. This means when somebody visits your school, they'll just get an extra bonus. It makes recruiting a lot easier. The opener and the closer do the same thing. One is for the first half of the week, one is for the second half of the week. Instead of having 5,000 points to allocate to players, you get 6,500 if you have both of them maxed. And out of these three, the one you want 1,000% and is without a doubt the best thing in terms of recruiting is kitchen sink. Super important to get those extra points. The difference between 500 and 700 points for a prospect is absolutely uncanny. And of course the glorious Saban factor at the top. Wow, that is a very, very updated listing and description for that. My goodness, you are the balls boys, the big cojones. If you are looking for a good overall playbook to run, I personally like to use multiple. I put the sub frequency down to 30. CPU no huddle on normal and put the run offense to 40. That's what I do when I start a dynasty. You don't have to do this, do whatever you want. But just for the people who are absolutely brand new to the game, I'm going to break down everything. On defense, without a doubt, the best playbook in the game is multiple D. This has 4, 3, 3, 4, and 5, 2. 5, 2 is without a doubt the best defensive formation in the game, at least in my opinion. Again, sub frequency down to 30. That's all I do. Now, shameless plug, but if you do like NCAA 14 rebuilds, I do pretty much stream them every single day. I do five year rebuilds every single day and upload them to the channel. But the important thing is I do them live. That link will be one of the top ones in the description. Come and say g'day. It's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun. For the use of this experiment, we're going with a one star team. The worst team in the game as of right now with this recent update is Akron. So this technically is the hardest I can possibly make it for myself. And I only am level three, so I can get scouting to three out of three, so I can, uh, you know, at least see what I am scouting. You know, I think that's at least fair on my end. So we've loaded into a brand new dynasty. First thing I'm gonna do is turn the bloody autosave off because it is very annoying. If you are playing the games, make sure you do save though. The game is very old and very buggy. So we've just loaded into it. I don't really care about the team or the schedule or what they look like. You first, before you look at any prospects, come over to recruiting strategy and make sure you turn everything off 
you do not want the CPU interfering with what you are doing at all because the CPU is absolutely dog shit. They do not know how to recruit my guy and I, I promise you, I'm telling you that. So generally the first place you should always start, especially if you have Instacommit is top 10 schools. This would mean that you're a more powerful school at this point, but if you're lower on the list, then your players are gonna probably suck. As of right now, it's not looking like there's a lot of great talent. So we're just gonna get right on into the season. All right, pause. Hang on just one second. If you want to at least try to get a head start on some of the top talent that could be low lock players in week two, stay here and add players to your board, maybe from a pipeline state. But for me, I just go all prospects and just start looking for the best available guys. Surprisingly, lowest lock percentage is not always the best. The reason for this is as you put points into recruits, they get closer and closer to committing to you, but it's not always the same amount of points for every recruit. This is where the initial preseason lock percentage comes in. The lower the lock percentage early on, the more points it's going to take to try to land a recruit. But basically a guy with 14% lock is going to take around 70 points to increase 1% lock. So that's just a piece of information that we wanted to share because it's not a very well-known fact in the NCAA community. But continuing with preseason recruiting, make sure you fill up your entire board with prospects before you even advance your week. It doesn't matter if you have any scouting points left. It gives you a much better chance of finding these players during during low lock cheese and if you have them now then you have a good chance of getting them to commit to your squad earlier which is crucial for having a big class in the preseason I targeted players at positions of needs and athletes and as you can see by sorting by squats and speed I was able to find many cornerback gems early on and got a head start on their recruitment as a whole even if you did go the level 15 route it doesn't really matter I'm gonna still be recruiting the exact same way so just keep that in mind now first things first when I offer this guy scholarship his bonus will change well it, it didn't but it should change i'm gonna go ahead and give him 500 points that should technically be 700 but we're making this as hard as possible you might have 13 people on that list we only had the one that's why we're just rocking with him now the most important thing forget week two we're going right to week three that is low lock cheese when it all starts when it all goes down okay so now we get into the fun business now one thing I do need to say 1000% is by the end of this season, this could either be the number one class in the nation or it could be the 40th best class in the nation. I don't get to control who goes where. No matter how hard I try and go after a prospect, I still might not get them. Believe it or not, in this game, recruiting is very easy when you know what you're doing, but at the same time, you need a lot of RNG to go your way. Especially when you're using a crappy one-star team, the more RNG you need to have a good class. So straight out the gate, I see Chris Watts. He's 15% lock rate. That means that nobody's really pursuing him at this point. He's the fifth best player in the nation. I'm already gonna put him on the board. But what you wanna do is go over to the lock section, hit sort, and then sort again. And this is low lock cheese. This is week three NCAA 14. Now straight out the gate, we see Brian Ward, 77 overall four-star prospect, 16% lock. Go through here and get whoever you want on your board. The furthest I will go is 20%. I do not go to 21%. I rarely even go to 20%. Normally I cap it off at about 18 or 19% based off how good the players are. At 17%, Adam Fontaine, 77 overall. He's the 11th best player in the class. Only 17% locked. That means he's on the board. Athlete, quarterback, wide receiver. I'm taking it all. You'll notice I'm skipping over the guards and that is for a very specific reason. I will share some more light on that in just a moment. A couple of things to note that Crow doesn't usually do that he should do. If a guy has a scholarship, that means that there's somebody interested and it's probably not going to be very feasible for you. Leon Miles, no scholarship, good to go. But Pierre Roberts, if we check here, he's got a scholarship from South Carolina. That means that they're interested and they're going all in on him. We don't want to add him to the board or it's just a waste of points. Keep in mind that three-star prospects are really good in particular situations. You can go after them if you so choose. I just like getting the best talent and that's all there is to it. 19% on Travis McRae. Ostrand, I'm taking you. Another quarterback, I'll take you. Defensive end, I'll add you on. For offensive linemen, linebackers, and I believe D linemen, this is super, super important. You want to filter by tackle guard and center individually, still with the low lock. Now, if you direct your eyes to the right side of the screen, 
you see squat. If they have over 600, that more than likely means they're gonna go up overall. Not all the time, but there's a very, very high chance of it. Players like this, however, AJ Johnson, 72 overall, 610. We might see him either hover around 71, but there is potential of about 74, 75 overall with him. Now, this is somebody you want. Justin Carlson is the best example. He's a three-star low lock guard, but he squats 655. This guy is probably about a 76, 77, maybe even 78 overall player. You guys always see Crow sort linemen by squats just because it gets good players, but why does it work exactly? So let me explain. For offensive line, and I believe tight end sorting by squats is a direct measure of their run blocking ability. But for skill positions such as running backs and receivers, it measures break tackle ability. So if you're looking for a power back or a balanced back, sorting by squats can be a really good way to guarantee gems as well. And for literally all defensive positions, squats is a direct measure of tackling ability. Every combine grade before scouting represents a particular value with 40 time being speed, bench press being strength obviously, and squats being for skill position players, break tackle, for offensive linemen and tight ends, run blocking, and for all defensive players, tackling. I did make a recruiting guide a couple years back, and in that contains a spreadsheet that shows all of the combine measurements, etc, etc. Charles Williamson had 605 squats before scouting, and the spreadsheet that I have attached does say that that should be about 78 tackling before scouting. We're going to see if it goes up or down, just relying on RNG. Alright, so it is exactly 78 tackling. If it had gone up, it would show a green arrow. Down, it would show a red arrow. Justin Carlson. 79 overall, easy as that. That's the guy who had the 655 squad, I believe. There we go, we got a gem at running back. Pretty slow, but I'll still add him on because I'm desperate for players at this moment. Travis McRae, he's a 78, we'll take that all day. And these are the players that the computer does not want. <laughs> believe it or not. Look at Brian Ward, 81 overall, outside linebacker. That is a, that's a 99 by junior season. Ah, but wait a second. You want to put points into Todd Scott, but it's not a good idea, and here is why. If a player is NA on your board, the points will do nothing. They're just a waste. Until there is a number by their name, the points will not count towards them. Do not waste your recruiting points. Crow, that goes for you too, buddy-o. All right, back in recruiting. We got 1,300 points back. That's from all of the, the scouting and the scholarships being given. Straight away, going to give Fontaine 500, even though it looks like we're not going to be able to get him already. Big yikes for us. Guess for now, we'll go Phil Carey and we'll grab another tackle while we're at it just because we have the extra points. I do like to put my prospects at the top. I think it might be a little bit of a myth. The higher up the list the player is, apparently the more they want to come. Ooh. I don't believe it. I'm very skeptical of it. But people seem to believe it, so let them believe it. All right, time to get an update on the recruits. We do have an overwhelming lead for James Randall now. Everybody's a very high 70, if not 80, to a low 70 down here. Now it's time to add more prospects to the board, right? So these are the most desired players. First of all, James Randall was the guy we had right from the very beginning. It does look like he's very interested in signing with us. Happy days. Now, in terms of bringing people in for visits, you want to do it as late as possible, but sometimes that's not the way to go. For example, Toledo might get big enough of a lead in that time, in that one week, to completely cut us off. But in this case, because James Randall really wants to come to the school, we I feel happy doing it the week after, even though, ironically, we are playing Toledo. To get our points back, this is what we're going to do. So we're in front by 1100, in front of Toledo. We're going to go to the top school section just by filtering across. They're only missing out by 20 points per week. That's fine. Moving on. With Seth Ostrander, Mizzou, even though they have a huge bonus, we are still in the lead. We are gaining 255 every week despite the bonus and everything. Now, realistically, based off that, you can go down to 250 and still be gaining five points every single week. Now, when you're building a team like Akron, that is very risky because if Mizzou just wants to flick it up and put up 500 points, they're just going to start smashing you, mate. So typically, I like to keep it 100 above. Right now, I'm gaining 105, kind of like a little bit of a safety blanket to make sure we pick up Seth here. And we get 150 points back. We're barely gaining on Chris Watts, and I don't like the look of this. Uh, I'm actually going to get those points back immediately, put them into somebody else. We are gaining on Brian Ward. Bama wants no part of him at this point. Still going to give him 100, though, because he's a big-time prospect. 81 overall. I really want this guy to join the team. 100 is a pretty good safety net. Now, after all of that, you can see up the top left, we're still gaining on all of our top-tier prospects. 
but we got all of our points back. This is where we reinvest into the players we want. Tony Robinson, don't really want the bloke, but I'll give him a scholarship and 500 points. You're at the top of the list. At this point, I'm gonna head back into the all prospects, low lock cheese again, and just basically try and find the best possible prospects I can. Simple as that. All right, so it is week seven. So there's one thing that I want to do that you probably don't know about. If you sort by less than 75% locked, for some reason, the game glitches to a particular percentage when a guy has been taken off of his top team's board. Paul Coley. This guy does not have any scholarships. He is not on Stanford's board and therefore will not commit to Stanford. If you haven't had a great class to this point, this can sometimes be what saves it. All right, so check this out. Kevin Rice, we've been keeping him on our board this entire time. And now if we wanted to, we could swoop in with 700 points and it wouldn't take us super long to steal him as long as Kentucky does not offer a scholarship. I get like maybe one or two guys per year using this method usually. Tony Robinson, 500 points, still got a big boy lead on him. Lead on him, lead on him, lead on him, lead on him. Uh, not on Justin Carlson. This is a very good example, right? This is somebody we had a very big lead on. This is the, the massive gem we had right at the beginning. This is what the big teams will do to you when you're a one-star school. As for Brian Ward, it's looking like even though we have the lead, Ohio State is in full pursuit. Even if I put 500 points on him, doesn't look like he's gonna be joining Akron. Same with Phil Carey, and it's the bloody same thing for Matt Rogers as well. If I did have more points at my disposal, I could maneuver my way out of this situation. But with the lack of points, I, I can't really do anything about it, unfortunately. Because I am worried about those bigger schools as well, everybody will be coming in as soon as possible. It doesn't look like we're going to be able to get James Keith either. We've already got 500 points in. Ohio State is just not going to let us have him at all, mate. Ohio State is gaining on us even with 500 points. We just can't compete with a 70 bonus and especially not without having 700 points to be able to allocate. Unfortunately, I'm in a, a bit of a pickle here and I can't really get myself out of it. It's gonna have to give it a couple weeks. Hope the RNG rolls in our favor. Okay, so check this out. This is what I mean about using your lock picks, okay? So as you can see, Tennessee just got back into this race with 1700 points just like that. So we know that we're falling a few points, but to be safe, we're gonna go down to 500, not too many, but we wanna make sure that we drop completely out of this battle. We're gonna use a lock pick and spring way up right before our visit. <laughs> and hopefully that works. All right, so there it is. Daniel McBride locks us out and you think that's a bad thing, but actually we just gained some real quick points. 15, 15 and check this out. Open the door. On the week of our visit, we're up to 403. We get that bonus back, 700 points, and you may have just turned a battle that goes to Florida every single time into you get a visit, maybe get the commitment. Not many recruits are really unobtainable. Okay, so this is the last chance for us to make a move. If we did have 15 points, we could potentially have 15,000 points to allocate right now. We only have 10. There is a lot of players that I really want to get. And I mean, really, really want to get. Isaiah Christensen, we have an overwhelming lead on. Considering we only have 10,000 to spend, I'm going to cheap out here a little bit. I'm going to give him 1,000 on the dot. Chris Watts, we have a 30 point lead over Oregon. I'm going to give him 4,000 points. Keep in mind as well that this is not an intelligent choice to make. If you really wanted Brian Ward, you would undoubtedly put 10,000 straight into him without a doubt. If you wanted Chris Watt really bad, you would put 10,000 into him without a doubt. To be completely honest, we're probably gonna miss out on Brian Ward and Chris Watts here, but uh, you know, science, right? Whatever, let's see what happens. Okay, we got them all, very nice. We even picked up James Keith as well. I forgot about that bloke, but nice. That actually turned out really good. Now, obviously because we signed what? Six people, seven people, this is not gonna be a top 25 class. Remember, RNG is such a big part of this. Somehow we signed 10 ones. I don't remember that. We got 19 players. Anyway, uh, we signed one five star, one four star, five three stars. But if we check out the little more info tab here, Watts was the five star outside linebacker, Brian Ward. He was the 81. Christian was a 78. Keith was like a 79. Yeah, like this is a really quality class. Again, I know there's not a lot of players here. You'd rather sign Four really, really, really good players at positions you need, like quarterback, cornerback, receiver, then sign 20. You do not want the 60s, bro. 
So there's another thing I really like to do after I sim through the bowl game. This might be another very cheesy thing in your eyes. But if you're tired of your players being homesick and transferring or leaving or whatever, all you gotta really do is edit the death chart at the end of the year. TJ Pollard may leave because he's third on the death chart as a freshman, but if we move him up, there's virtually no chance of him leaving. And also, his red shirt won't be shed because he didn't play a single snap. Just make sure you do it after the bowl game. Okay, transfers. Keep in mind, they do take up a scholarship. If you're in a situation where you have 24 scholarships and there's a guy you really want and there's like a 50 overall coming into your school, don't take him because then you can't get the 81 overall because it takes a scholarship. We have a quarterback for the future. He'll be 99 in a couple years. Dylan Bray will also be high 90. Nate McCoy will also be mid 90. You'd have Isaiah Christian, who would be a mid-90, Chris Watts, who would be a mid-90, high-90, and Brian Ward, guaranteed 99 overall. You do this three times, your team's all of a sudden 95 to 99. Now, even though that was a very horrible example, and we didn't get a lot of players, a lot of quality players, still got quality players, let's go flip over to a brand new, completely fresh dynasty with a team that's about four-star. So obviously, since we covered so, so much in this season, we are not going to go into another season with a new team in this video. We'll save that for another part. However, I will say that using the same methods that Crow used besides more preseason recruiting and using a three-star school, I got a 22-player number one class in the nation. So this is the best surefire guide to getting top classes in this game. It feels weird to say, but Crow is not here, so we gotta do the outro. If you made it this far in the video, you are the real MVP. Hope the rest of your day is awesome, and for me personally, I'm out. Peace.